Hey, I'm Dave Asprey, founder of Bulletproof, and people call me the father of biohacking because I started that too. And if you're looking to learn more about how your biology works, you want to know more about biohacking, then try listening to the Hacked Life podcast with my friend Joel Evan. Hey, what's up? Joel Evan here, host of the Hack Life podcast and weight loss coach for busy men. I'm excited to tell you I just dropped an eight-week program dedicated to motivated and busy men who want to lose weight. Let's face it, guys. When you lose weight, you feel more confident and you have higher self-esteem and you go out and you crush the world. You crush your goals and you start living your higher purpose. So if you're interested, DM me at Joel Evan Coaching or email me below, info at joelevancoaching.com. All right, I'm here with none other than Dave Asprey. Dave is the creator of the hugely popular Bulletproof Coffee and the founder of the Bulletproof Company. He's a three-time New York Times bestseller. Four, I'm sorry, four, because we're going to be talking <laughs> about that. And we're going to be talking about that. <laughs> but who's today. counting? Who's counting? <laughs> um, I'm going right off the bio, by the way, of the book. So in fastest way, I must have already made it to number four then. Uh, yeah, that was it. Yeah, and he's also the host of one of the top 100 podcasts, Bulletproof Radio. Dave, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here for you. You know, just to start things off, I wanted to ask you, you know, you are known as the founder of biohacking, and you coined that term, biohacking. Yep. Can you believe, like, after all these years – I've been following you for at least seven years when I found out about Bulletproof Radio and the Bulletproof Diet. But can you believe that it's come this far? Did you ever imagine like it was going to grow to become this? I set out to create a global movement around biohacking. Uh, and I didn't trademark the term, <laughs> which I totally could have done. But I, I didn't want it to be mine. I wanted it to be a, a global movement. And that's what hacking is. You know, the the guys who made Linux and the whole open source movement, which is supporting almost all of the conversation we're having right now, they were tired of not being told what was inside their Microsoft software. So they wrote their own and it actually changed the world in a meaningful way. There's probably some of that code running on my aura ring too. And so what hackers do is they realize that something has power and they say, we should have that power to do what we want with it. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Otherwise, if only big companies have that power, They'll do bad things with it. So I wanted biohacking to be a thing. It's like we own our own biology. No one else does because the tools we use will be used to control us if we don't have knowledge of them and the ability to use it. And you can use bad food and glyphosate and a bunch of crap to make people chronically sick and sell them a lot of drugs. I don't think there's a bad emperor deciding to do that. That's just the emergent behavior from you know setting rules where we'll maximize profits. So screw that noise. Like I want to be in charge of me. And that was why I thought it had to be a community movement. And that's why I've always held the biohacking conferences, why I've opened the coffee shops and upgrade labs. They're community meeting points for people who care about controlling their own biology. So this is what it's supposed to do. Yeah, man, that's what it's all about. I mean, it's about that community. It's about that connection. And that's like, that's how you, that's how you really grow a movement, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, people have to believe in it and it has to work. And it's the difference between a, a movement and a fad. Well, biohacking has been around for 10 years now. <laughs> it's, it's been in vogue yeah. and, you know, glamour. And it's a big thing in Latin America. And you go to Singapore, they're doing it. You go to the Middle East, they're doing it. It is a global thing. And I'm happy that I, you know, lit the fire, but it's millions of people at this point. Yeah. Let's jump into some, uh, let's jump into fasting. You know, you just came out with this amazing book, Fast This Way. And, you know, one of the things that came to my mind is fasting's nothing new. You know, and matter of fact, <laughs> you made it. I invented fasting, didn't you? Yeah. Know? <laughs> well, actually, that's what Come I want to talk right? about. I mean, you know, when you look back at the Bulletproof Diet, I mean, that that was in 2014, right? And so. Well, the, yeah, you know, the print version came out, but it was online in 2011. Yeah. And it, it included intermittent fasting, but I, I was really joking. I mean, fasting's been around for thousands of years. We just ignored it until recently. But that was one of the first modern books saying, hey, you should pay attention to it. But it was like one of five things. So. I feel like it got lost in the translation. A lot of people say bulletproof go keto. I'm like, good God, guys, you, uh, could, you can do keto in the 90s. It's called Atkins. It's cyclical keto, low toxins with <laughs> intermittent fasting, blah, blah, blah. But um, I thought of all the five big things, you know, there's the avoid lectin part of it and other stuff. But this is the one with the highest ROI for someone who's new. Like, I just want to lose weight or I want to feel good. 
Like, wait, their investment was I didn't have to make breakfast. I didn't have to pay for breakfast. So you, you get paid the second you get breakfast and then you feel better all morning. Like, oh, I got paid again. And then you don't get diabetes. I got paid again. <laughs> and then I don't get all the diseases that diabetes is the precursor of like cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's and cancer. Like I got paid a fourth time. So I thought it was worth a book on its own. But the the challenge is my, my publisher was an editor came to me and like, Dave, you got to do a book on fasting. I'm like, I already did one. It's called the Bulletproof Diet. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And then I'm like, what am I going to write? Step one, skip a meal. Step two, it's good for you. Here's some references. Because like, that's the fasting book, right? Yeah. So this was the hardest book to write because I had to tell my story of fasting in a cave for four days and the psychology and emotions and how they come out of biology. But I, I am really convinced now the book has sold more than 100,000 copies um, it's a different book on fasting than any other fasting book out there, which is my goal. Cause I, I would not write a me too book and waste someone's time. Like that, that's not okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's funny you say that. I mean, it, it, you, you bring to light in the book, like it's actually, it's not, it's not that hard and you can actually do little things to make fasting easy and, and fun. You don't have to you don't have to strive for these 24 hour water fast guys. You can do fast in other ways. And I, I got, that's what I got out of. It's like, it's not really, we, sometimes we get in so in our heads like, Oh, I, I'm not going to, I can't fast. I can't fast for full five days of water fasting. And you're like, there's a lot of easier ways you probably haven't thought of. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, there's, there's a lot of times on panels, people say, hey, Dave, um, what's the one thing that you struggle with the most? And and I'm like, look, I actually don't struggle with things. I just don't believe in struggling because <laughs> struggle is the wasted effort around working to get something done. And you work on it and either you get it done or you don't, but struggle could take up 50% of your effort. And imagine you're trying to lift a heavy, uh, heavy bar, right? And if you're going, mm, rah, rah, and you're making faces and also it's all wasted electrons that could have gone into lifting if you would just hold still and focus, right? So the whole struggle thing is a big part of what costs people with fasting. And some struggle is emotional and psychological and some struggle is biological. Like maybe we could hack the biological struggle so that you don't feel pain during a fast because there is no merit to, I, I leaned in on my 24 hour water fast and I'm a better person. I'm like, yeah, how'd you treat your kids? How'd you show right. up at work that day, right? right? And the bottom line is there's a working fast and then there's a spiritual fast, which is about leaning in and relaxing at the same time. And then you get the, usually the keto bros, like I intermittent fasted and I ran the Ironman. And, but meanwhile, you look at their labs and their biology is like destroyed by this because it's self abuse, right? So I wanted to write that book that was like, look, here's how someone who was like me, 300 pounds, substantially overweight with brain fog and joint pain and early risk of heart disease and all that kind of stuff, how would you fast if you didn't want to suffer and you didn't want to struggle? And it turns out there's three things that are well validated that work. Some of which we know more about now than when I first wrote about one of them 10 years ago, but you can do that and you still get the biological benefits of a fast and get this Joel 60,000 people signed up for the free fasting challenge that I put out with the book. You don't have to buy the book. It's literally just a gift. I teach the book over two weeks, but that's yeah. a lot of people. And a lot of them never fasted before. And the comments are like, I can't believe I went 24 hours without eating and I wasn't hungry. And to me, it's the and I wasn't hungry that's the win. Yeah. That's what matters. And yeah, sometimes hunger is a teacher, but it shouldn't be your teacher Monday through Friday if you're fat like I was, because then you just can't show up. And so it's about setting people free from that story about struggling through a diet or fast. I don't struggle. I'm never hungry. It's awesome. As I drink my it's coffee. So, it, it, it's so funny. You know, you say that and... I wasn't hungry, you know, as a health coach and uh, actually going through the, the Human Potential Institute. That's that was where I first got started with uh, with coaching. Um, thank you through your program. But oh, you're welcome. A lot of people don't even know I, I had a coaching training program for like six or seven years now. <laughs> so thanks for the shout out. Yeah, no, it, it was a it was a huge impact on my life. And speaking about just connection and community, I, the, the amount of people and other coaches that I've met through the program even supersedes just the knowledge that I got, but it was the amount of people that I'm still friends with today. So it's uh, anybody that wants to, to do that should, but cool. Yeah. It's a good community. Yeah. You know, just with what you said though, there's some, some of my clients and the ones that I do specifically for weight loss, they'll say that all the time to me. They're like, I'm good, man. 
I'm good. And and they're like, I thought this was going to be hard, but I'm good. And like day two, they're like, I'm good. And uh, I love I love I love hearing that as well. It's just such a powerful feeling because now they're taking that ownership and they feel like they can again. You know, they can do this. It's sustainable. And they can. And most of the time, if you're on one of these low calorie or low fat diets, it creates anxiety in the brain. And we have studies that show that now. And fat, at least the right kinds of fat, will turn it off. And so all of a sudden, okay, I can struggle through my day because I'm low energy, I'm cold, I'm thinking about food all the time. Uh, normal people, 15% of their thoughts every day are about what's their next meal. If you're on a low fat, low calorie diet and your metabolism is broken, it's probably half your thoughts. You're tormented by food. You're like, oh, and I'm gonna write this report from my boss and I'm gonna deal with the kids running around the house or all the other stuff. It's no wonder that you kind of hate your life by the end of the day and then you look at yourself in the mirror and say, how could I keep this up for the next 10 years? You can't. It's okay. Yeah. Like you have to change something in order to make it work so it's effortless and pleasant every day. And then you can do it forever, which is where I am. That's what I teach. Okay, so let's talk about that. How do we make it effortless and painless? Because in the book, you've got these several examples of fasting. Like you've got like the 16-8. You've got the OMAD, the one meal a day. What does Dave Asprey do on a regular basis? Or what's like the type of fasting that you like to do? you know, for the most part. The most important thing that you could get out of reading fast this way is that there is no correct length of fast for any given day for any given person. And the reason for that is that your biology changes on an hour by hour and day by day basis. So you could say tomorrow I'm going to do an OMAD fast, right? Like I'm all set up. I'm only, I'm going to go 24 hours. I had my last meal at five o'clock today. I'm not going to eat until five o'clock tomorrow. And that sounds like a really big deal, except if you're used to skipping breakfast, well, all right, you have dinner, so then you sleep, you wake up, I wasn't gonna eat anyway, and then noon comes around, you go, I guess I'll skip lunch. And then you have five more hours, so it really feels like you really only fasted for five hours, it's not that big of a deal. But you wake up, and you're like, oh my God, I have a headache, you know, the dog barking and the wife kicking me or whatever kept me up all night long. I looked at my sleep data, I got almost no quality sleep last night, my heart rate variability is low, you know, my joints hurt, I probably had something last night I shouldn't have, and um, and then my boss calls me at eight and says, you know, you're gonna have to come in the office and you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, your, your gerbil dies. Okay. <laughs> it's the worst day you can imagine, right? <laughs> Maybe you should have some freaking breakfast, right? You have enough emotional and biological stress in your body right there that the OMAD is a terrible idea. <laughs> Right, and maybe just a 12 hour fast. You know, I, I went eight hours of sleep or about that much. I'll just wait, I'll have breakfast at 10 a.m. Right, I'll have some eggs and bacon. And it's just, it's okay, it wasn't a failure. It was matching your nutritional intake to your biological stress level because fasting is like exercise, is like being sick. It is a stressor on the body. It's just, it's a good stressor that creates health, whereas being sick generally doesn't do that. So what you wanna do here is match your biological strength and for women, it's even easier. Like, oh, <laughs> uh, where are you in your cycle? Because sometimes you have more biological stress than others. And a lot of women do really well with longer fasts right before their period. And then during their period, they don't. But it's it's actually different for different women. I've interviewed some who say, oh, no, I could never fast. And others like, I have to fast then. So you have to tune it. So what do I do every day? I pretty much have breakfast, usually Saturday morning around 10 a.m. I have uh, breakfast, usually bacon from pigs we raised on my own farm. Um, and we have a family brunch, right? And I'm actually not hungry then. I just do it because it's social. And then I have an earlier dinner on Saturday. So I, you know, my eating window is still about eight hours. But generally, my eating window is eight hours or less every day. Uh, and sometimes if I wake up, I'm like, I don't know. If something's not right, I might have a 10 or a 12-hour eating window. But I never eat uh, in bigger than a 12-hour eating window. Some, and the other thing that I won't do, if I do OMAD for more than five days in a row man, my sleep goes to hell. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate, it's probably my favorite fast would be eating one meal a day at 2 p.m. And when you do that, for the first, for women it's usually two or three days, and for guys it's usually four or five days. After that, don't, like you can only do this for a couple days in a row. Um, after that, um, you do that, you sleep like a baby, and you wake up and you just don't care about food. You don't even want one of the fasting hacks from, from Fast This Way, there's three fasting hacks in there. You just, you're like, oh, I'm good. And then two o'clock rolls around, I guess I could eat. And it's so effortless and you eat, you know, a big old ribeye or something you gotta get, for me, 2,997 calories is my basal metabolic rate. You know, thank you for being 6'4 and having a little <laughs> bit of muscle on there. 
But I mean, that's a lot to eat a meal. I don't even think I eat that much a lot of yeah. the time, but there's no way I can know. You can, you can weigh your food and you're weighing water. Mostly it's completely fantasy that, you know, the calories in your food. Wait a second. I thought, I thought it mattered calories in calories out, man. That's the old it's adage. Totally true. That's why I actually, when I'm really hungry, I just have some gasoline because it's high in calories. <laughs> it's very satisfying. <laughs> People don't know I this, like but 30% you... of the calories in your steak get, get used up digesting the steak. But when you eat, you know, your vegan loaf or something, the percentage is much, much lower. It goes straight to straight to your blood sugar. So was it calories in or calories that you got out of the food or uh, I don't know. It seems like there's a little bit of funny math in there. Yeah. You know, real quick on uh, speaking of steaks, what's what's your thought on on people going, you know, just pure carnivore? I understand some of the whys there, but long term, what do you think? Well, if you look at the, the updated Bulletproof Diet Roadmap, and you know this from the Human Potential Institute, and the Bulletproof Diet Roadmap, by the way, anyone can download it, daveasprey.com slash roadmap, it's free. And it, it categorizes foods. There's the bulletproof zone, there's the suspect zone, where some of these foods mess you up, but you might be okay on them. And then there's the kryptonite zone, like just don't eat that, it's not good for you. And if you look at the carnivore diet, it's 100% green zone on the Bulletproof Diet. So you're there. And in the book, though, I talk about what happens if you eat excessive protein for long periods of time. And what you end up in, with in a situation like that is chronically elevated mTOR, which is something that's good for you when you put on muscle, but bad for you if you don't want to get cancer. It's a pro-aging, but pro-regeneration compound. So it's a very weird one. You want to spike it, then suppress it. Spike it, then suppress it. So if you wanted to do carnivore for two or three months to completely reset your gut bacteria, I totally support you. Make sure you have enough collagen because that's really the only kind of fibrous sort of thing that you'll get. And by the way, what's the first book that ever said collagen could be fermented into butyrate? Yeah, it was a bulletproof diet. And when you look at that, you say, okay. And by the way, that was in leopards, to be really clear. <laughs> I'm like, this is proof that it's possible. And it kind of got bastardized. <laughs> so humans do it, but they probably do it. So yeah. uh, I'll, I'll bet on that one. Anyway, um, so... You would want to eat nose to tail if you do that. So getting the organs is really important. And I've been talking about that for years. I hate liver. I take liver capsules I have forever because they're much better. I used to freeze the little bits of liver and just take them like, like they were pills. It just, it's gross. I haven't found a way to cook it, but you have to do that. If you're going to, if you're going to do carnivore for a while after three months, <laughs> even some of the leaders in the field, like, well, I find I feel better if I have a little bit of honey and some low <laughs> tox and veggies. I'm like, yeah, there's a name yeah. for that, my friend. It's yeah. called the Bulletproof Diet, right? Yeah. And, you know, that's great. I did the same thing. I went like excessively keto when I was stress testing the Bulletproof Diet, one serving of broccoli a day, nothing else, all meat and eggs. And uh, uh, I did have coffee too, but most, most uh, people on the uh, paleo or not paleo, but on the carnivore diet will drink coffee anyway. But, that was all I had. And man, after, after I felt great for the first month, but after that I got a leaky gut, right? And I actually oh, developed additional food allergies and it's very common when you do it. So how long should you do it for a while? By the way, you want to go vegan? Just don't eat the inflammatory plants. Do that for a month too. And there's, there's sure. a guy named James Clements who's on my show as a friend. He actually proposes a month of vegan, a month of almost carnivore, a month of vegan, a month of almost carnivore and proposes that we do that on a regular basis to suppress mTOR and spike mTOR. I don't follow that because it's too much work and the vegan diet just makes me feel like crap, even though I was a raw vegan for a while. So um, that would be an answer. Short term, I think it's good. Long term, I think it's questionable. And even some of the long term proponents do, don't do well, but some of them do. Likewise, there's probably 1% of the population who doesn't thrive as fully as they could, but they do pretty darn well on the vegan diet. But it's very low percentages, but it's possible right? You just would feel yeah. better if you did it right. And this, those same people on the, you know, excessively carnivore, I do great in this for years. I'm like, yeah, but if you added a little bit of soluble fiber, you'd probably do better. But you know, there's a bit of a dogma thing on both sides of that. But I, I'm generally, I'd much rather be carnivore <laughs> than a standard American diet. And yeah. I'd be happy to do it for a few weeks. It's easy. Yeah, no, I think your friend, uh, Joe Rogan, uh, he, he was doing the vegan, he's getting great results from uh, the vegan diet as well. Wait, is he vegan now? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, I was like, no, I did. He, I mean, he, he is a little bit known for being a, kind of all over the place, but that would, that would yeah. be a surprise. Yeah. Would it, but with carnivore, if you do longer fast, wouldn't you be suppressing mTOR? And then when you have like, if yeah. you did like an OMAD style. So what if you did longer fast and carnivore, would you be able to balance that out? You I think, think or 
Still if no. you're doing intermittent fasting and circadian eating with carnivore, it's going to work way better. I mean, if you're eating 12 hours a day, having little steak bites every 10 minutes, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> that's yeah. really bad. Yeah. So yeah, you're probably going to get some benefits, but I bet if you look at both gut bacteria and you look at cortisol levels, almost anyone who does OMAD every single day is going to get high cortisol over time. And almost anyone who does OMAD, even without a zero carb diet, is likely to get cortisol issues. And women hit it before men do. And they typically find that first their cycle goes off, sorry, first their sleep quality goes away, then their cycle gets irregular, then hair gets thin. And for guys, it takes us another two or four weeks. And then, oh, our sleep is no good. Same thing happened to me on this three month thing. Then after that, oh, okay, I wake up without a kickstand. Hmm. Right. Mm. And then hair thinning happens. So, does that mean everyone should avoid the carnivore diet? No, try it for a month. It's probably going to get rid of a bunch of bad crap in your gut, right? It's it's a good idea. I just don't, I don't think it's a good idea to do it forever. Uh, yeah. There are a few examples. They're just so random. It's also very hard to do it because most people I know who do carnivore eat cows and other animals that are fed omega-6s because they can't get it somewhere else. If you're going to do it, it has to be grass-fed. By the way, the Bulletproof Diet, grass-fed or don't eat it. You know, so you have to do grass fed and most pe people don't, and then they get bored. What are you allowed to put on a carnivore diet? Salt, <laughs> right? And maybe smoke salt if you want to like go out on a limb, uh -huh. right? And so most of them, I'm like, that's freaking Tabasco sauce on there. Do you know that there's two lectins in there? And the whole reason you're doing this is because plants want to kill you, which is accurate. Like this, yeah. this is the chapter one of the bulletproof diet. Like here's the four ways plants are trying to kill you. You should, you should be aware if you're sensitive to those. So. I'm spiritually aligned with the carnivore movement. I just feel like it's a short-term tool, not a long-term lifestyle. I'll yeah. bet you money that five years from now, most of them are eating non-toxic veggies on occasion. <laughs> uh, I think you're right. Yeah, no, I think you're right. It's yeah. just too hard to sustain, man. Um, you know, speaking of the Bulletproof Diet, uh, the book that we, your, your, one of your first books, um, other than the baby, the Better Baby book, but when you think about that book, and from everything you've synthesized now, has has your mind changed about? It? Have any of those principles or ideas have you have you changed your stance on anything that you wrote back then compared to now? In the Better Baby book or in the Bulletproof? Sorry, diet? the Bulletproof Diet book. I just wanted to acknowledge that other book that you also wrote. Yeah, I'm I'm working on a, a refresh to it. What we know now is a lot more about gut bacteria than we did back then. I've been uh, an early advisor and investor in Viome. They discovered 10,000 new species of gut bacteria that oh. we just didn't know about and added those uh, to the dictionary of human knowledge, which is really cool. And I've been able to quadruple the number of species of gut bacteria using several different tree saps, basically prebiotic fiber that is keto compliant. Uh, and it's something that I put together for uh, a fiber product for Bulletproof, for a prebiotic fiber but I tested it out on myself like I like to do. So I would have included a little bit more guidance on prebiotic fiber. And I think I would have come down even harder on kale than I did. I I was looking for ways, because people, especially back in 2014, it was like, everyone, I have to get my kale, I have to get my, I'm like, how do, you, how do I do this safely? And, you know, so I'm minimizing it, but I'll use it in a recipe. Now I would just be like, F kale, like, it's bad <laughs> for you. There's no reason to eat kale on the planet. It's it's garnish. Like most of my animals know not to eat it. I think chickens will eat it, but I, like it's it's just not good for you. So I think I would just be a little bit more direct about that. Yeah. Otherwise, I've been teaching all of my books this year. Thank you, pandemic, for keeping me at home. So I have this group called the Upgrade Collective, and it's it's at ouruprgradecollective.com, and I'm teaching thousands of people. Like every chapter of the book, I go through it and I teach it so that you know why did I write it, how did I write it, and lots of information like how to eat, and all my books are I have a class. So I just revisited every page. And the one thing that came through to me at the end of that was, man, I nailed this. <laughs> like I forgot I wrote that part. I'm like, wow, yeah. I've read five more studies that support that. And you know, the part about lectins, there's a whole lectin movement. Like this was pre-Dr. Gundry, who's a friend, Right, and the oxalic acid, that's only hit in the last two years. Yep, that was in there. The omega-6 thing, that's gonna peak this year and next year. Where we're like, oh, seed oils are really bad for you. I'm like, yeah, that was in there. Yeah. I feel like I, I, did, I did a pretty good job. I maybe didn't hit intermittent fasting schedules enough. I just said, look, skip breakfast already. Yeah. I knew that probably lunchtime was ideal, but no one will ever do that. So I was a little maybe biased towards practicality versus naming the best. And then 
making, you know, here's what most people will do, but if you wanted to be perfect, you would do this. I could have done more of that. But overall, I, I think it still stands the test of time, and I wouldn't say that if it wasn't real. Yeah, and you know, one thing that I see coming up a lot more now is being talked about is the protein fasting, which you were one of the first ones to ever even talk about that. And I, that was like a really new idea back then for me. I'm like, whoa. And now I'm just starting to see more of that research kind of trickle out that, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's, that's, there, that's there's that's only two viable. studies, but I tried it. I'm like it works. And, uh, yeah, that I, as far as I can tell, and I read a lot, I think that was the first book that brought a protein fasting because it was very soon after uh, the research showing less than 15 grams of protein in a day. And I do credit that, um, to my friend, um, Josh, uh, in the book who, uh, mentioned it uh, to me. I was like, you need to look at all this research. So I looked at it. I was like, all right, that's pretty cool. Uh, and uh, said, you know, this is worthy because if people want to eat for one day a week, this is how to do it. Or you could just do OMAD, which is frankly less work. And in the the fasting challenge, and uh, by the way, fastthisway.com, it's free. You can take it right now. Two weeks, I teach all the fasting stuff. But in the fasting challenge, everyone who tries protein fasting and tries OMAD at a different time, like, why would I bother with a protein fast when I could just not eat anything at all? It's too much work yeah. to eat low protein foods and I don't like how I feel. Like, welcome to how everyone is. This is why plant-based diets are dumb. Plant-heavy <laughs> diets are good. Plant-based diets are stupid. They just don't work. It doesn't matter if you say it over and over. You have to be the president of the United States to say lies over and over and have people believe you. We won't believe big food anymore that way. So good. Oh, I love that. Uh, in all your research that you've been doing for for the book, and just like you said, going back for to teach your classes, the the um, the upgrade collective, is there did anything surprise you uh, with the research on fasting? Was there anything that like kind of jumped out at you? You're like, wow, I didn't I didn't know that or didn't think of that one. Probably the biggest one was that 15 percent of the average person's thoughts every day are about food, like what's for my next meal. And coming up on the psychology and kind of spiritual side of fasting was was really interesting. And just realizing how much of a boost you get if you can teach your body to not think about food. A 15% brain upgrade, additional thought capacity every day, that's enormous. Right? But having hard data for that was cool. And the way I look at things, and I explain this in the book, and this is kind of based on really all of my books help to inform the model here. But my trainings in computer stuff, artificial intelligence, decision support systems, and I worked in Silicon Valley for the first half of my career making stuff. And there is an algorithm for life, and it's based on four F words. And what we do is if you're a bacteria, you have to run a very simple set of rules because you're just too dumb. You're a bacteria. You don't have a brain. You don't have like major sense organs. So all of your energy goes into fear if there's something that might be scary. You run away from kill or hide. So that fear is the first F word, 10 times more focus. When you're not afraid, five times your normal focus goes into food, the second F word, because famine might get you to just eat everything, right? And then the third F word gets three times more focus than it needs, and that's uh, fertility, uh, <laughs> or the other F word for that. And so this is what all humans are still running, because we have ancient bacteria calling the shots inside our cells. So everything everyone's ever done that they're ashamed of comes from those three things. You know, oh, I went on the date I shouldn't have gone on. I ate both pizzas, yeah. right? And I didn't take the job. You know, I shied away, didn't ask the person out, what, whatever the fear thing was, right? Well, if we can tackle food and get 15% better, fear is at least two or three times stronger than that. So if you can tackle fear around food, then you've got maybe 30% more mental capacity, 40% more mental capacity, but your brain opens up. And the other thing that I didn't write in there, um, at least in enough detail, I think, uh, I touched on it because there isn't a paper on it, but having talked with even more people who fast now, when an animal has no food in its stomach, including a human animal, well, all of the mitochondria in the body are sensors, right? They, they, look, they look around and then they decide whether to make energy, neurotransmitters, hormones, proteins, they can make all sorts of stuff besides energy. Well, if they're looking around, well, then you have more awareness of your environment. So if you are fasted and you go for a walk in the forest, you've actually sensed the forest differently. So there's a thing that fasting does that has to do with being connected to reality. And it's hard to put words on that. It's hard to put a study behind that. Yeah. But some evidence we have for it is that some states that are documented in 
Ayurvedic texts and in yoga and, and things like that, you have to be fasted usually to experience a state of samadhi, you know, oneness with everything. And part of that is the ketones of fasting, but I think part of that is the environmental stuff that's happening that we don't really know about. Yeah, that is so cool. What about um, fasting and, and exercise? If someone wants to lose, is that, a, first of all, is that like a good idea? But if you're someone that's wanting to lose weight, is that recommended? And then what if you're someone who's trying to actually put on muscle? Should they be fasting and exercising? You should definitely fast from exercise because exercise makes you tired. I mean, isn't that obvious? <laughs> Just don't do it. Just don't even bother. Don't even do exercise. Now, with exercise, there's really good evidence for this. And you can use fasting to get more out of exercise than you would expect because you want mTOR levels high, which is what causes you to build muscle when you exercise. So bodybuilders know this, which is why they just keep an eye all the time. They eat protein every 20 minutes or something, and then they get gas from it because fermenting protein in your gut is a really bad thing. And there's a better way. What you do is you fast because you want to compress mTOR. It's like a spring. You smash it down. The more you smash it, the more it'll surge forward. Three things we know from studies that suppress mTOR so it'll bound back harder. One of them is fasting, <laughs> one of them is coffee, and one of them is exercise. I call it tripling down on exercise. Wake up, drink your coffee, bulletproof or not, doesn't matter. Wait a while, right before you're gonna have a meal, exercise. And it can just be some squats and push-ups. It doesn't have to be crazy, but you can do a full whatever you wanna do. And then eat within a half hour and have some protein for sure and probably some carbs, but not high glycemic carbs. And you, of course fat, because you really generally eat fat with protein anyway. And Magic happens when you do that because that mTOR that you just smashed down, it comes surging forward. So you get more results from the workout because now you have high mTOR. You shouldn't have high insulin, but you should have moderately elevated insulin, which also drives nutrients into the cells right when the mTOR growth signal is there. It actually works. And you can do that and people, um, people report really good results from it. That's how I'd recommend mixing it. Yeah. You'll see a lot of young people, especially young men in their early 20s, like, oh man, I woke up. I killed it at the gym and I didn't eat until two in the afternoon. I'm so tough. When you work, work out heavy, like a heavy lift and you don't have protein within about a half hour, you get a 48 hour cortisol spike. And if you eat protein within a half hour, you don't get a 48 hour cortisol spike. So were you young enough and tough enough to handle a 48 hour cortisol spike? Yeah, you were. Was it good for you? Were you burning the candle at both ends? Yeah, you were. I, I think we can do better. So it's just about having the right knowledge about this stuff that really, really matters. Yeah, I, I love how you just talk about that, that, that balance. You know, anytime you start something new or like even for me, like, and I think that's one of the, the, the quote unquote bad things about uh, biohacking is that people go down these, these just routes or just like the keto right like oh i gotta be it's so dogmatic i gotta be so i gotta be in ketosis all the time and yeah, i've gone through that route too I, i'm like i gotta take another cold shower and i started to just zoom out and detach a little bit and go dude i have a lot of stress going on in my life maybe a cold shower to stress my mitochondria is not a good idea like you said so i love that idea of just and that's what your book is really about it's just finding that balance you know and making it work for your life it is about balance and I love cold showers. I don't take them every day. If you're completely tweaked when you wake up, don't take a cold shower. It's not going to serve you. And studies show three cold showers in a row, um, you know, one day, two day, three day, um, even for one minute is enough to change levels of cardiolipin in your mitochondrial membrane. So your, your energy producing cells work better. Great. So do that. And if on the fourth day, you'll probably want to do it because it feels good on the fourth day. In fact, that's the first day it'll feel good. The first three days suck. Yeah. But if on the fifth day you don't want to do it, it's okay. You can skip a day. You'll still get the benefits if you do it most of the time. And there is a human tendency where if something is good, then I must do more. It'll be right. better. And this is why people fall into the fasting trap, the vegan trap, the keto trap. They're all the same thing. I did some of it and I felt good. Therefore, I'm going to do it all the time. And then you overdo it and then you get sick and you have to come back to a cyclical nature because that's how we live in cycles. Uh, and with biohacking, well, some biohacking is good. Therefore, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to do 47 biohacks today. Now, you may think I'm a little bit nuts here, but here's my list, right? You know, I have spreadsheets and whatever else. But it's not there, so I'm going to do it every day. It's just so I know when I did it. 
right? And yeah. some days, you know, there's a bunch of columns, but I only check off three of them, right? And some of them are very simple and some of them are more complex. And I'm like, did I use testosterone today? Did I you know, do some kind of weird breathing exercises? Did I, you know, insert name of some other thing that I'm going to be doing? And some of it's experimental protocols that I haven't even written about because I'm going to write about them. Some of them are just regular practices. Nice. So just letting yourself skip it is fine. But I'm doing something right now that if it works, I'll write about it. But you've got to do it every day for five days. So, okay. I'm doing that one every day for five days. But if it means I don't do something else, it's okay. So this perfectionism, it's just fear. It's the first of those F words. It's those dumb little mitochondria going, if you're not perfect, no one will love you and then you'll die. And fasting, if anything, is about learning to go without. And it reminds me of a friend in business school. He was top of his class at Berkeley. <laughs> and he was going to be top of his class at Wharton. And he goes, I got to get over this. So he intentionally gets a B in a class just so he won't have straight A's because <laughs> he was fasting from perfection. I'm like, you yeah. go brother. That's actually what it's about. So perfection is a problem. Be imperfect on purpose until it's not scary anymore. And the, the idea of fasting is going without, you, you can fast from junk food. It's called eating healthy. Fast from carbs, it's called keto. Fast from animals, it's called being dumb. I mean, vegan. <laughs> you can, I mean, you can fast from, you know, high color vegetables. If you want to see what happens when you, it doesn't matter. Like, like it means going without for a period of time, you can fast from water for three days, maybe more. It's probably not a good idea to go that long, but a 24 or 40 hour dry fast can be really beneficial. It's just rough. I didn't really cover those in the book. So fasting from social media and the biggest challenge in the book is fasting from hate. Spend four hours without thinking a bad thought about yourself or other people or other things. Just try it. Uh, yeah. Almost no one's capable of doing a hate fast unless you're either a very advanced meditator or you've done a lot of neurofeedback. So wow. there you go. See, you thought bad thoughts about me when I said that I, I was reading your mind. <laughs> what I was actually thinking about is when are you going to come out with a T-shirt that says F. Kale, hashtag bulletproof? I think that's, the, uh, that's what I was thinking about. Uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's time. It's time. Um, you mentioned in the book a lot of cool hacks and supplements that you can supplement with with your fast um, you mentioned activated charcoal systemic enzymes adaptogens prebiotic fiber any any of them that you you just you really gravitate a, a lot to or or not so much I do most of them most of the time probably the the most interesting one for listeners is systematic uh, protein digesting enzymes because one of the things that happens when you fast is all of your pancreatic and some of your liver and other enzyme producing capacity. It's like, I got no steaks to digest. What should I digest? Oh, extracellular junk and intracellular junk and I'll handle autophagy. Funny enough, those are three of the seven pillars of aging in my book about how to live to 180. So these are big processes. Since there's nothing else to do with the enzymes, do that. But what would happen if you took several enzyme capsules that added enzyme capacity to the body. Could it do more cleanup during your fast? It can and it does. And there's 30 years of research of taking protein digesting enzymes on an empty stomach to help the body recover faster, have less scar tissue, digest old scar tissue and, and adhesions, make the blood less likely to have blood clots. So you might as well take a couple of those on an empty stomach because that's when you take them and your stomach's empty, you're fasting. So I think there's a great argument for that. Things like serapeptase, natokinase are the most commonly known ones. Yeah, very cool. One of the um, the hacks that I've been experimenting with is your inner fuel, your prebiotic. And um, I've been checking it out just with my hunger levels, but also I have a CGM from Levels right on me. And yep. um, it's actually pretty remarkable. I'll usually do, because uh, I just love coffee, I'll do two cups of Bulletproof in the morning, uh, back to back. And one of them, I'll add the prebiotic, I'll add the inner fuel, and my blood sugar has actually gone down after the second cup. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Which is like, I'm like, with, and, and I attribute that really to the, the prebiotic uh, fiber. I, yeah. mean, I know the brain octane helps too because it kind of blunts that caffeine response, which is going to increase the cortisol. But um, yeah, it's been kind of cool to see. I'm like, whoa, like this prebiotic stuff, no it, joke, man. It's real. You have to have the right types of prebiotics in there. And it's on the label. I mean, people can go out and mix up their own if they want to, but it's a fairly priced, very well-made product with lots of clinicals I looked at. Um, here's what's happening. When you exercise, do infrared sauna, uh, or have a cup of coffee, um, all of those are going to raise adrenaline and cortisol. 
And one of the primary things that those hormones do is they increase blood sugar. <laughs> they cause a little bit of, of glycogen to be released from the liver uh, or from the muscle, or they can even cause muscle to break down. But they're like, emergency, give me some carbs already. I need glucose, right? Because I'm under a short-term stressor. And coffee doesn't do it very much. If you have a cup of black coffee, you don't see a big spike on your levels, right? But it could be like five points or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sam on mine. I, I've, I'm an advisor and investor in levels as well. Um, do you have a Do you have a link for those guys? Are you an affiliate? No, not yet. I'm trying to. Uh, All right, well, let me let me share this then. It's not an affiliate link, but it's to get to cut to the front of the line. <laughs> so there's a hundred thousand people trying to get them, and they can only do it so fast. Levels dot link slash Dave just lets you cut. <laughs> So that's the best I can do. But anyway, I, I really appreciate that. That's the only way that, I got cause... one, by the way. So yeah. Oh, you use that link? Yeah, okay, cool. That's the only way. Um, so I just like to share that because, hey, you know, I, I believe in what they're doing. You you learn a lot by putting one of these things on, on your arm. And I see the same thing from Interfuel. But here's the biology. Okay, so your blood sugar goes up when you do something that's stressful. It just goes up a little bit. And if you're putting the butter and MCT in the coffee, it does it changes something called a pharmacokinetics. So it changes the rate of absorption of caffeine, we believe. And it, it probably does that, just putting any butter, any MCT in any coffee. So I'm not making any claims about any one company's products. Right, this basic biochemistry stuff. So that means that the caffeine doesn't slam you as fast as it would if you're just drinking uh, normal coffee. But really, normal coffee doesn't slam you very hard because if you measure it, you're like, oh, I got a tiny blip in my blood sugar. So you've slowed that down. But now you put in the inner fuel, the prebiotic fiber. And there's two things going on. One is it's probably going to slow it down more because fiber is shown to slow absorption. It also increases satiety even more than the butter and the MCT does. And there's plenty of studies of each of those ingredients that shows that they do that. So I'm going to say, okay, given that each one does it individually, all three of them together most likely do, unless they magically cancel each other out, which they don't. So then... What else is happening? Well, the gut bacteria, as soon as they get that stuff, the good guys grow and they will poop out butyric acid. Butyric acid is even more ketogenic than brain octane. So what you did is you also boosted your ketones that way. And the higher the ketones, the less the body's gonna be screaming for energy in the form of cortisol because it's like, oh, I have enough energy. It's just coming from ketones. It's one of the reasons that um, you, you feel less anxiety when you're drinking little bits of fat in water. And there's two or three other reasons, but the chemistry is pretty, I don't wanna say well understood, but we understand a lot more than we did 10 years ago about how all that stuff works. And it's pretty elegant, but most importantly, you can try it and you're like, wow, I measured a difference with data and I felt different and you probably poop different too. So there you go. I do poop different, I'm gonna say yeah, it works. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that you read my mind. Um, I want to jump into some light. I'm looking at the time, and I know you have a hard stop, so I want to jump into some lightning round questions if you're game for that. All right. You ready? Yep. Awesome. Um, if the old you could see the new you, what would the new you say? Um, I would say uh, people actually want to help you. Just listen to them. Because <laughs> uh, when I was younger, I was like, I have to do all this myself. Um, you know, I'm not going to listen to people. I'm not going to accept any help and getting, I uh, just knowing that there were always people there who wanted me to win. I just had to find the right ones. There's also people wanting to lose, but I was just like, nope, I'm doing it all myself. So if I could have been less stubborn there, it probably would have been helpful. I love that. So be more trusting. Yeah. What, uh, what are some choices that you, uh, that you made that you think made you who you are today? Uh, one of them was definitely, um, just deciding that, you know what, I've worked out an hour and a half a day, six days a week for 18 months. You know, I, I really pushed it. I'm on a low fat, low calorie diet. I'm still fat. And the decision that, you know what, this isn't working. Like it's not, it's not a, it can't be a moral failing because I actually did what they said and I just didn't get the results. And it's not that I'm eating too much lettuce anymore. And so that decision that I'm going to have to hack this, I'm going to have to take charge of this was a really pivotal thing. Um, that was an important one. I would say, when I ran out of Western stuff that didn't work, it's saying I'm going to go learn meditation from the masters in Tibet was a really big deal. Uh, and the other one was when I started uh, attending and then running the anti-aging nonprofit group in uh, Silicon Valley for about 15 years, I was chairman or president or board member. And so just learning from people three times my age, that was kind of a big deal. Yeah. Still do it on my show. Well, that's why I do it. Yeah. 
No, and that's something that you you highlight a lot uh, on the show is that, that that idea of wisdom from from our ancestors and just ancient and the people, and it's so can, powerful, man. Can I just can I just say old people rock? <laughs> <laughs> Like they know more than we do. Like, oh yeah, when I was fifty, I went through that. I was still young then. And you're like, well, what what else is coming? You got any hints for me? Yeah. And they do because they already saw it, right? So anytime I can spend time with people over seventy, it's precious time. Yeah, agreed. What are uh, what are some exciting projects that you're working on right now? Well, Upgrade Labs is my company that's bringing biohacking everywhere. And there's two of them in LA right now, in Beverly Hills and Santa Monica. And this has all the biohacking technology. Well, in another, what's today? In another probably two weeks, maybe a little bit less, I'm opening uh, one in Victoria, British Columbia, an Upgrade Labs, and an Upgrade Cafe, which is a new name for the Bulletproof Cafe. And so that restaurant will have food raised on my own farm. So true farm to table where I'm in control on both sides. Wow. We're also franchising Upgrade Labs. Uh, it'll be all over the country and the world uh, in very, very short order. Uh, so there's huge interest in that. And uh, that's happening right now. Uh, other things, the, the um, biohacking conference, the virtual one is May 8th. And if you go to biohackingconference.com, uh, you can sign up for it. So that we're looking at the largest conference we've ever put on by a long shot. Uh, wouldn't surprise me if it's uh, substantially north of 10,000 people attending all at once, all in a community, all learning about biohacking. So that right now has most of my focus because that's coming up in a very short amount of time. That's awesome. That's so cool. Is there anybody in the health, wellness, biohacking world that inspires you? Um. Man, anyone? There's so many people. I, I mean, yeah. that's why I do Bulletproof Radio. I get to interview a lot of these people. Or anybody um, that you follow, one, I guess, on a regular basis? Most of what I do comes off of PubMed. Like, so I I have a, a search engine that searches through PubMed um, and like shows me exactly all the latest research in the areas I'm interested in. So that's my social media feed for taking in information. Um, that's... You know, that's just a different way of, of digesting it. But I, I like to see the headlines and read the paper and then go, aha, and then I draw the connections. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that I follow a, a biohacker specifically, but I um, I do look at like the, the doctors who write books. So I, I always am friends with Dr. Mark Hyman, uh, Perlmutter, uh, Daniel Amen. Um, guys like that, usually on the cutting edge, I'm, I like Dr. Gundry. Um, you know, he's got he's a very heavy dude. Like he, he, he pioneered robotic surgery. I mean, he's not just a diet guy. He's like, I just ended up at the gut after a really serious career. Uh, and I, I do a lot of work with Barry Morgulon, uh, Dr. Barry. He's a UCLA surgeon who's been on my show a couple of times. He's speaking at the biohacking conference, but he's actually Dr. Strange. Like yeah. He went to the monastery in China. The only white guy ever to be trained as a grand master in this ancient lineage. And so I do his exercises in the morning and uh, I learn a lot from him, but I don't know, is that a biohacking or is that something else? Hey, someone yeah. in the health and wellness world, Dr. B yeah, is great. Yeah. Any, any books that you would recommend for people that had a huge impact on your life? Oh, wow. Um, anything by Robert green, but his most recent one, uh, the laws of human nature is his opus. Talk about learning from, you know, the, your elders and wisdom. He has studied human behavior for his entire life and written epic books about it. His 48 laws of power changed my career when I'm like a 26 year old in a boardroom where I have no business being like, why are these people acting like clowns? I'm like, no, they're following the laws of power. I just don't know them. And then, you know, the, you know, another 25 years later, you read the laws of human nature. You want your mind blown, read the chapters in that book about envy. He nails it better than anyone from any discipline that I know of. And I'm like <laughs> friends with a lot of people who know about this, you know, Jack Kenfield. I, I go to his transformation leadership council and the leaders in personal development, we're all circling around like, how do you put words to nebulous emotions? He nails it. And it turns out envy is the hardest emotion to see in yourself. And he's like, here's the, how to look at it. Here's how to know you have it. And here's the antidote for it. And he just lays it out. And he says, here's how to see envy in someone else. And of all the weird emotions and bad stuff we do, it's the one where we're most likely to do it without ever knowing we're doing it. And so that was really a big book and just so worth reading. Uh, I got to recommend that. That's great. I haven't read that one. So thank you. Um, you got it. And also, let me toss something else in there. Yeah. 
Studies show 15, 20 minutes of reading fiction several times a week changes your brain in a really meaningful way. Audiobooks count, by the way, for changing that same part of the brain. So you can't read just nonfiction. So you need to pick up something. And if you've never read any Neil Stevenson, um, that stuff will blow your mind. He's probably the best writer of the last 50 years, just in terms of use of language. And he has great cyberpunk and great historical fiction. They're all good. Um, the cryptonomicon is probably the one that bridges the two, but listen to one of those. If you really want to get smarter. Okay. I got to start up a new habit. Thank you. You got it. Um, and obviously you're the father of biohacking. So, and you just told me you have like 70 hacks on a spreadsheet. Is there any rituals or hacks that you do on a regular basis or something that you kind of like consistently like to gravitate to? Um, Every morning I do the, the Dr. Barry uh, practices, by the way, he's energyforsuccess.com is his website. So every morning I wake up and I do like a 15 to 20 minute uh, auditory meditation breathing exercise thing. I don't miss that one very often at all. I spend a few minutes uh, setting goals for the day. I, I pretty much do that at least six days a week unless you know something weird happens that's unpredictable. Um, so that's pretty common. Um, coffee. I don't really miss coffee very often. I, I have that on a regular basis. And you say, that's not a biohack. Dude, it is. You do your coffee right. It, it, just Google any disease and coffee and see what you find. It's ridiculous how good coffee is for you. So I do that. Um, other than that, you know, there is not that there's this thing that we do. We say, I want to do it every day. So I don't have to think about it. Right. But biology doesn't want you to do that. Because you can take something and make it into a habit so it becomes effortless, but then you don't have cyclicality to it anymore. You have regularity. And once it becomes regular, it, it doesn't have the same stimulating effect on the body. Yeah. So, sorry, I don't have a lot of habits other than that, you know, wake up, I do a little, a few of the kind of Qigong-ish things that go along with journaling. Um, other than that, some mornings I'm going to do some weird breathing. Other mornings I'm going to sit in front of a weird electrical device or I'll do an infrared sauna or I'll do cryotherapy or I'll do something else, electrical stimulation. Like it doesn't have to be the same. You mix it up. The more you can mix it up, the better. And the more you feel like you're missing out because you didn't do everything, the worse off you'll be. So you have to be like, look, today I did one thing to make myself better. That's what I ask all my employees across my portfolio, which is now like six companies. And wow. I also ask that of myself and ask this of my kids. And it doesn't have to be a big thing, but it has to be one conscious thing to make yourself better. And anything above that's gravy. You don't have to say I did 10 or I'm a loser because that's not a good way to win. I love that, man. Thank you. One last question. 2020 was a crazy year for a lot of us, right? It was the pandemic. It was all this fear and this craziness. Some some people had a really tough time. But people like you, I, I know you look at things way differently. So I want you to reframe it. So finish this sentence. 2020 was the greatest gift because... Uh, 2020 was the greatest gift because it gave everyone the ability to cook and eat whatever they wanted instead of eating restaurant food. Not everyone took advantage of that. That's one thing. It let everyone save money who still had a job uh, on uh, commuting. So there's actually more savings now than there has been in a long time and people are spending it. Uh, it also let a lot of people have enough time to learn about cryptocurrency and there's many, many new crypto millionaires, which is cool. Yeah. Uh, for me, it gave me time to teach all of my books and the Upgrade Collective that I probably wouldn't have done. Uh, and it gave me time uh, to to get Upgrade Labs to the point where it can uh, it can franchise. It gave me more time with my kids. And, you know, politically, things are pretty weird. Yeah. But I like the old definition of pandemic, the pre-2004 definition, where it was a rapidly spreading disease that kills a lot of people. The new definition of pandemic is a rapidly spreading anything, whether or not it kills a lot of people. Literally, they changed the legal definition. Yeah. And so, I don't know. I, I'm an old school guy. I'm going to go with the old one. This is not technically a pandemic. It is a government mandated pandemic, but it, the death rate isn't high enough. And it is higher than normal, but it's not high enough to be a real pandemic. Give me Ebola, 30%. Black death, 70%. Those are pandemics. We're not quite there. I don't think we're going there. Not this year, not next year. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. This was amazing. Um, last but not least, where can people find you? You can go to DaveAsprey.com, which has all of my stuff. Bulletproof Radio is a great place to hear the podcast. And if you'd like to do the fasting challenge where I teach you how to do all the different fasts and things like that, if that's of interest, and join 60,000 people who either have done it or are doing it with you, fastthisway.com. Awesome. Dave Asprey, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Thanks, Joel.